Um, and I think we'll find that this panel uh, will uh, duplicate a little bit the previous panel. So they stole a little bit of our thunder, I guess, group, right? Uh, but I'm sure we'll uh, exceed expectations, or at least we'll try to in this regard. Um, it seems like in, uh, in my uh, previous life in the government, where I worked in the Department of Defense for uh, 31 years, and, and it seems like I'm always uh, asked to, to answer the more difficult question, which is, uh, how do you uh, stop something um, versus just describing the threat? Sort of like when I worked in NSA for, for many, many years, uh, you know, I was on the defensive side most of the time, and it seemed like our job was a lot harder than the offensive guys. So, uh, so I think I find myself in the same situation, but luckily we've got a great panel, and this panel will try to take the momentum from the previous one uh, to try to, I think, get to uh, some interesting thoughts on, uh, on stopping this threat that you heard earlier talked about by the, by the previous speakers. And we, as you heard in the previous uh, group, uh, it, it is certainly a daunting problem that we face uh, these days. And, uh, and so I'm going to just open it up for the, for the panel to, to each one of them give a few minutes uh, of, their, of their thoughts. Uh, as, as leaders in this field, and we're very fortunate to have, as I said, this group. We've had a few people uh, who had some unfortunate family emergencies at the last moment who had to drop out, uh, but uh, we've got this group together that I think will be as equal, if not superior, uh, than our original uh, group. Uh, and so with that, let me just kind of start and work our way down left to right to keep it easy, if that's okay with you. Stuart. Yeah, Stuart, I think many of you may know, but uh, Stuart uh, uh, was at uh, the Department of Homeland Security. He was the first uh, uh, a, a senior in charge of policy, Assistant Secretary for Policy for DHS. And, and as we all know, when we created DHS after 9-11, that was a very, very tough job. And he's learned a lot of lessons from that, I'm sure. And uh, so let's uh, have Stuart give us some of his thoughts on stopping the threat. Stuart. Yeah, the lesson is don't do it. <laughs> uh, you know, doing a startup in government, which I've now done a couple of, uh, is just deeply painful. But, um, uh, so um, I would like to, you can't hear you? Okay. Uh, I'd like to popularize and start this with what I call Baker's Law, uh, which is our security sucks, but so does theirs. Uh, we can, you know, the fact is, uh, the, the real enemy of security is operational necessity. There's things you have to do. Uh, you've got to accomplish the mission. You take a little bit of a shortcut. Uh, uh, and that's the end of your cybersecurity. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, that, that, that operational necessity works on the other side, too. They've stolen stuff, and they've got to get it down to the, their state-owned oil company in time for them to get their bid in as well. Uh, and they're going to take shortcuts, and we're going to be able to figure out who's doing this. And this is the critical point. Uh, I sometimes liken this to uh, Pigpen. Uh, um, he's got this just ball of dust surrounding him. Uh, this is what we're like in cyberspace. There is just bits of digital DNA flying off us at all times as we take one shortcut or another and find ourselves losing control of our identifying information. We're doing that. It's happening all the time. We all know that. Uh, and so are the people who are attacking us. The, the important thing about that is this means that we can attribute these attacks. We can actually identify the guys who are doing it. Sometimes I put up that uh, uh, photo of the anonymous attackers uh, who were busted because they put up a very low-cut picture of one of their girlfriends uh, uh, a, and to mock law enforcement and didn't realize that the picture had been taken with an iPhone, uh, which very helpfully provided the geographical coordinates uh, of the girlfriend. Uh, um, she was, they, they didn't show her head, just the rest of her. Uh, 
Uh, I've often thought that, um, you know, uh, the Secret Service and the uh, FBI must have arm wrestled for who was going to do the ID in that case. Uh, um, it, so we can, we can begin to identify people uh, uh, who are attacking us. That's the attribution stage. We really can do a much better job than we have to, uh, in attribution. And then we have to bring, like I'm a Scots-Irish kind of guy, uh, uh, we need to bring the pain. Uh, we need to show the folks who are attacking us that it's a painful thing to do and they'd be better off choosing a different career. Uh, and for that, I think we are going to have to get uh, much more creative. But uh, I testified last uh, week to Judiciary Committee and suggested a number of things that we could be doing. Uh, all you have to do is read the Mandiant Report, read the Trend Micro Report, uh, read some of the or the uh, the report that Citizen Lab did. Uh, uh, there is l there are lots of clues to the identities of the attackers. We know where they went to school. In one case, uh, they, they went to Sichuan University, and the kid uh, uh, who was uh, engaged in those hacking at attacks uh, later went to work for Tencent, which is an enormous. Uh, Chinese internet company with a big subsidiary located in the United States. Sichuan University needs visas to send their people to the United States. So does Tencent. Why aren't we saying, hey, we got an investigation going. Uh, we'd like you to cooperate. If you don't cooperate, no visas. You can go home and, and, and train. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that today. Uh, um, specially designated nationals. We have systems for saying, these are people who are engaged in trade in conflict diamonds. And we want to take the people who are engaged in that, designate them as folks who the uh, US uh, government says no one uh, can do business with those uh, uh, conflict diamond nationals. Uh, they do the same thing for Belarusian oligarchs. Uh, the Magnitsky Act does this for people who are interfering with human rights in China. Well, for God's sake, you know, we have people who are interfering with our human rights right here in the United States. We ought to start designating those nationals uh, and causing some pain for people who are engaged in these attacks. We know enough to designate them. Let's start doing it. Uh, and then finally, and, and I'll close with this, uh, we need to, uh, to take the information that we're getting and follow it through not just to the attackers, not just to 61398, but to the guys they're feeding with our stuff. Uh, and um, we need to find ways to tag that quote information as it goes back to China and then on to a state-owned uh, oil uh, company so that we can say we know where that uh, information went. We've tagged it and followed it all the way. And now we are going to take every nickel you have in the Western world for engaging in economic espionage with criminal prosecution, civil lawsuits, and the like. We can do all of that if we set our minds to it. We're going to have to change some laws, but not very seriously. We just have to take it seriously. Thanks. So, Jenny, I'm going to I'm going to let you go last because you're our government representative here this morning. Okay. Oh, you got to press the button. I wondered how that worked. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, just just uh, I thought I was going to be the oldest person on the panel until Stu walked up. So now, now I feel, feel like I've been vindicated. But uh, just just to give you some context, when, you know, when Chris Inglis was talking, he was talking about the code making and code breaking uh, roles at NSA, and I was a code maker uh, for for the early part of my career. Probably I had been there about 20 years when Chris actually arrived on the scene, and uh, he was working in something called the Computer Security Center which was relatively new at that time in the, in the 80s, because we were, we were starting to you know, think about, how, you know, we've been building encryption. That's what I did. I built encryption boxes. I was not a crypto mathematician, per se. I never really understood the difference between a Fibonacci sequence and a Fibonacci token sequence. It was, always, it was somewhat mysterious, I, but I could make the boxes work. So that's what, that's what I did. But we started thinking about, OK, beyond encryption, as you know, in the 80s, the internet was just starting, the early 80s, the internet was just starting to take shape. So we started thinking about this question called computer security at the time. 
And, uh, you know, there was the orange book and the red book and the yellow book, and uh, I think Chris was involved in that. He was trying to think up the colors. So I said, what, ne what color is we going to publish next? I think that was his job. But anyway, uh, we went on from there, and we, you know, we evolved into information assurance, and uh, I think it's still officially called information assurance, but uh, it's really focused on cybersecurity now. And, and I, I'll say the lot's been covered already. I don't want to repeat what the previous panel has said. But you know, a couple, couple of observations out of, out of the discussion. Uh, education, uh, particularly, uh, you know, is a good thing, but it's never going to solve the problem. I mean, if you're expecting consumers to change their behavior, that's really a fool's mission. They're going to behave the way consumers behave. And if they get an email, uh, some people will always respond to that email saying, you've won the Ugandan lottery, just send us your bank information and we'll send the money to you, okay? We're never going to stop that behavior. Uh, you know, educating them, and you know, I think we're going to have to do more in the consumer space about automating the security processes there. You know, we shouldn't have to have the consumer check the box and say, I want the automatic updates. I mean, that's dumb. I mean, they, that ought to be a part. You want to use the system, you want to use uh, the operating system, you want to use the applications. You got to have the updating process in effect so we can, you know, so that the providers, the technology providers can fix the problem for you. Uh, you know, we, we participate in something called the NCSA, the National Cybersecurity Alliance, which is DHS, uh, you know, industry-sponsored thing. And if you go to the uh, NCSA website, uh, it's got 10, uh, 10 guidelines for uh, how, do you, how do you secure yourself, okay? And it says, you know, change your password regularly. Uh, the one I like is configure your, your, your uh, computer in a secure fashion, okay? <laughs> So how is the consumer going to do that? I have trouble. I've been in this business a long time, and I'm not a computer geek. I was studying vacuum tubes when I was back in college. So I'm not a computer geek. Uh, computer science hadn't even been invented yet. And uh, you know, how do you expect the consumer to, quote, configure their machine securely? I mean, that's just not going to happen. So we have to, we have to start to deal with that from uh, if, if you want to use the technology, you gotta, you're going to have to accept the fact that your, your security has to be managed by the technology providers. It's never going to be configure it yourself. You figure that out. Okay, to step uh, uh, to the larger question, how do we protect critical infrastructure? Let me say a couple of things. Uh, number one, I think defense in depth has been very successful. But it was, it's, it's the, the, the uh, security model has always been evolving. When the internet started, there was no security. Everybody trusted each other. It was a set of uh, you know, host machines at academic institutions that were networked together. And everybody trusted each other. And if somebody got out of line, they were quickly you know, put back in line by the rest of the, of the peers. That obviously has changed. I think the firewall was first invented probably late 80s, early 90s. I still have the Bellevue Cheswick book on my, my desk called Falling, Foiling the Wily Hacker. And it was the, the internet firewall was invented. And it basically said, you know, we've got to close some of the ports and protocols that you're not using and, you know, keep those guys out. Well, that worked for a while. But then the hackers said, well, I, you know, I, now I'm going to figure out how to tunnel through that firewall and tunnel through the protocols you have open. So it's always been, and, you know, defense in depth came along as an evolution of that thinking. Clearly, we're now at the stage where we've got to move away from, you know, the, the early discussions about the static defense and go to a much more dynamic, adoptive environment. And that's going to take some, th some things that we're going to have to do collaboratively. Uh, information sharing, if I can use that word, is, is an essential part of that, but I, I think of it in really in terms of a higher level. I mean, sharing signatures, sharing threat warnings, that's all great, and it needs to be, you know, we need to do more of that and make it more operationally focused, as I think somebody already pointed out. You know, sharing for the purpose of sharing is a waste of time. Sharing so I can block a new threat, that, that's much more useful to me. But if, if I start to think about how do I get ahead of the power curve, I've really got to do my analytics. If I'm looking at my internet portal and I'm analyzing the, the traffic flows, uh, that's good, okay? But what I really want to be able to do is analyze it at the next larger scale up to, you know, in fact, ultimately take it to the global network level because that's the way I can actually understand what's really happening in the network and as new threats emerge, I can be on top of those. Now that's going to take some doing to move from where we are today and, and localized analytics to uh, global base. We do it at AT&T. We do it on our global network infrastructure. So we have a pretty good view. 
but it's only our view. I don't share the view with Verizon at the native level. We're now doing more collaboration with Verizon and the other tier one carriers uh, as we're dealing with DDoS attacks against the financial institutions, which I think Ellen mentioned earlier. And so we're, being, we're, we're actually changing our business model, in effect, to help deal with that. Uh, but the driver ultimately is be how do I really understand what's happening out in that global infrastructure and be able to deal with threats as they're emerging. Those zero days start out, you know, somewhere, and we want to be able to find them where they're starting as opposed to, gee, I just got compromised, now I, I got to clean up the mess. So that's kind of, a, I'll, I'll stop here because we are kind of, you know, constrained on time, but, uh, you know, we got to change our thinking and our approach to security and, and a point solution here, a point solution there. We've got to move to a much more global view of what's happening, and that's going to take you know, global collaboration, international collaboration, as a part of that. Uh, we're, going to, we're starting to try to do that at the uh, internet service provider level uh, and, and opening up dialogues with, uh, with international partners. Uh, we peer with you know, a large number of the global carriers, and so why aren't we doing more in terms of just developing a common understanding of what's happening in the network. And that can go down to the packet and uh, you know, protocol level uh, and, and be able to identify those zero days before they become successful. That's what you're really trying to do is get ahead of the threat. We also have to work, work towards uh, driving the technology base to be naturally more resilient and more secure. We're just starting to understand how to do that. But in the commercial world, that's a big challenge simply because they're, you know, the technology's always moving. And you know, uh, Microsoft's been been deal, trying to deal with uh, security at the native level in their development process, but you know they brought out Windows 8. Okay, and Windows 8 brings a whole new flavor to things in the operating system realm. And so we're going to learn things as we go. I, I see we learn something every day about cybersecurity. Right? We usually learn several things, uh, just because we're we're there and we're doing it. Uh, so you never stop and say, I, I understand the problem. In fact, I'll, I'll close with my favorite saying in the cybersecurity business, if you think you understand your problem, you're badly deluding yourself. So, thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, now next is uh, John Gilligan. John uh, was, uh, during the DOD days, uh, probably one of the most innovative CIOs that we had. He was the CIO for the Air Force, and now he uh, runs his own company. And uh, John, could you give us your thoughts? Uh, thanks, Bob. And thanks to CSIS and FireEye for uh, putting on this session. Y you know, I'm thinking back, and it's been <clears throat> almost 40 years since I first got involved in cybersecurity, computer security back then. I went to a seminar in uh, graduate school and ended up getting a graduate. They, at the end of it, they said, we have graduate assistantships available. And that was caught my attention, and so I raised my hand. and. Spent the next couple of years designing, trying to design secure systems, trying to mathematically prove systems. I spent most of my subsequent career not doing computer security, but designing and building IT systems, uh, and now more recently, you know, in helping manage companies. And uh, the, 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 the topic of stopping the threat, to me, has to be looked at in terms of a business perspective. And I come to these sessions and, candidly, my head hurts. And it reminds me of, a, of a, a story that I tell often. When I was CIO of the Air Force, we spent about $7 billion on IT, a lot of money on uh, computer security. I had a pretty good background in computer security. And uh, what I would find is each year as NSA came in to do their penetration analysis of the services, then they would call us all together, so they'd line us up like a panel here, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and they would debrief us on what they found. And the first time they did that, um, I was terribly embarrassed because it wasn't did NSA succeed in breaking in, it was how long it took, and that how long was in minutes and seconds. And, uh, and the types of attacks, every one of them was successful. And I'm thinking, my goodness, if somebody from the media had been sitting in this audience, I would be um, pillared in the, in the media for, for spending $7 billion and not being able to protect even. Uh, and, and so the second time this happened, I was very frustrated. So second year, same briefing, very frustrating. And I went to NSA and I said, uh, I need to know where to start. It's not like we're not spending money. I need to know where to start. And that ensued a discussion that uh, I'll shorten, but at, at the end of that discussion, NSA came back and said, well, we've now analyzed the threat, 
and based on the threat, here's where you ought to start. That was enormously enlightening. Um, and so I want to fast forward that same discussion today. So uh, Verizon just produced their latest uh, uh, Verizon data breach investigative report. Very enlightening. There are a number of other reports that are similar out there. But to me, what catches my attention is that really things haven't changed dramatically from my Air Force days. The majority of threats in terms of number are unsophisticated and they're attacking very straightforward weaknesses. Uh, that's really important. Uh, second, and, and some of these statistics were mentioned earlier today in the presentations, the, the breaches are not discovered until weeks and months after they occur. Unsophisticated and discovered weeks and months later, and most often discovered by people external to the organization. And yet we're spending, 30 billion was the number that Dave DeWalt used, others have used a lot more. We're spending all of this money, what the heck is going on? Well, um, I've spent some time trying to analyze that. Uh, you know, being on the board of several companies, this becomes quite important as, gosh, if we're going to spend all this money, we would hope we would get some return. And, and what I've discovered through that uh, analysis and, and looking at the reports is, in fact, the most um, prominent threats are unsophisticated attacks. And it turns out they're relatively easy defeated. We have now demonstrated through, um, you know, the, the research and applying different names, but a set of a, a minimal baseline set of controls that you can um, be effective in protecting against most of those uh, attacks. Um, one set was developed in the United States that's called the Critical Security Controls. Um, SANS Institute, NSA, a number of other organizations did it. Um, the Australians have done, have come up with their uh, similar top 35. Interestingly enough, their research shows that only four of those, four, four controls are effective against 85 percent of the threat. So the conclusion is what we know how to deal with, we know what we need to do, we just don't do a very good job of then implementing these threats. Now I'll tell you a little secret. As CIO, what I learned is it doesn't cost a lot of money to implement these baseline controls. Why? because most of them are essential to operating and managing the network. It's just doing them in a disciplined manner. And in fact, most organizations are already spending the money. In fact, many are spending more than they need to because it's not that they don't have the controls, it's they have multiple sets of overlapping controls inconsistently applied and so they leave gaps, et cetera. So step one is implement this baseline of critical security controls. Now, that does not address the sophisticated um, threats, I, I acknowledge that. But if you don't do that, you're wasting your money trying to address sophisticated threats. You're kidding yourself. So all of the discussions about the sort of the, well, I, I recall my kids used to play soccer, you know, everybody would huddle around the ball. And that's what I see often organizations saying, we're going to go after these sophisticated threats, they're shiny, we're, they're exciting. But unless you have done that foundation work, you're wasting your energy. Now, what I have found is organizations that beyond the critical controls, what they're doing and what's most economical is not to continue to layer control upon control upon control. And I think that's the big flaw in what NIST has been uh, providing in their risk management framework. It's well done, but it really just continues to drive cost upon cost upon cost. What we're seeing, and we heard this well today, is that the very sophisticated advanced persistent threats in the nation state attacks they're agile, they're intelligent, they're dynamic. And in order to respond to that, you have to be likewise, and I think there's been great discussion about that, so I won't repeat, but you have to implement that time, that same type of capability. It cannot be done strictly with tools. It has, there has to be a human element. The sharing of actionable intelligence is critically important. The ability to look at patterns of attacks, and eventually, those that are most sophisticated are actually able to predict What's going to happen? What's the next step of the attack? Why? Because they're, they see the patterns, they're, they're studying it. And so I think all of those then are the next step and sharing uh, becomes absolutely critical because organizations in general can't afford to do that on their own. So anyway, let me stop there. But I think, I think we sort of know some steps. It's not to say that other comments, I mean, obviously diplomatic and other, other avenues we ought to pursue as well. Uh, but, but I think from a technical perspective, 
there is a better roadmap than perhaps we've been able to implement. So I'll stop there. Thanks, John. And I think John points out an important topic uh, that he's working on with APSEA, which is focusing on uh, the theme of cyber economics. And I think that's one of the key elements of cyber where we are today, which is I think if we can uh, get our resources proportional to the threat so that we can take care of the ankle biting problems with the least amount of resources, but do it smartly, but then focus the, you know, the other part of our resources on the stuff that will kill you, that's what we got to focus on. And unfortunately, we're spending, I think we're finding a disproportion of our resources on the ankle biting problems because we're not doing the basic stuff. And as a result, we don't have enough resources to focus on that 15% that will be the stuff that will give you the, uh, the heavy injuries or the fatalities, like, like in a case of an automobile analogy. So I think that's the situation we're in today relative to moving from static to dynamic defenses that we've talked about uh, this morning. So, so how do we get at this situation in cyber economics of moving in this new paradigm of security that we're, where we are facing ourselves uh, right now? And so we've asked uh, Irv Lachko uh, to talk about an area that he's focused a lot of his attention on. He's a CSIS senior fellow which is called active defense. And we've talked a little bit about that. So I'd like to, you know, with that set up, Irv, I'd like you to talk a little bit building upon what John uh, mentioned. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, right, so I'm gonna talk about this thing called active cyber defense. And of course, the minute I say that, um, we're, I guarantee you that we're all in this room on a completely different page in terms of what that means, because there is no a widely accepted definition. Um, so the defense strategy for operations in cyberspace defines it uh, as basically real-time technical protection of the dot mill network. Uh, but in, in the popular parlance and the articles that are showing up in the media, it's often interpreted as meaning hacking back. Um, and so um, there's a lack of understanding of what the term means. And often what happens in discussions about active cyber defense is people end up in one of two extreme areas. Um, either looking at this sort of hacking back area, which gets legally very dicey very quickly, as any lawyer will tell you, or just saying, well, we're just going to look at activities that we can do within our network, which are perfectly legal um, and have been going on uh, in some cases for decades, so honey nets and gathering threat intelligence in a variety of ways, um, and that's, that's uh, perfectly safe uh, legally. Uh, but there's an interesting gray area that's, that's developing, and people are starting to pay a lot more attention to this uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that um, the government simply cannot respond to the magnitude of the threat facing the private sector. Uh, if you read all these reports, you, you just see it's a huge problem, and a lot of companies and organizations are on their own. Now, hopefully, with some of the, th some of the initiatives that the government has announced with, th with the information sharing, things might help. But unless it's a major breach, you know, the FBI just doesn't have the resources to, to come and help you in a lot of cases. The other thing is the private sector is growing incredibly sophisticated in many ways in terms of its ability to uh, analyze the threat and potentially even respond to the threat. So there's an increase in motivation and capability on the private sector side. And so then there's this interesting question that's starting to come up, which is how far can the private sector go to protect its intellectual property, its assets that may be leaving the organization? Um, so a lot of folks are starting to look at this. And again, in particular, there's this interesting sort of gray zone um, where one can start to look at things like um, uh, beacons in information that leave your network. So can you, you know, w can you put a passive watermark on your document, for example, and have it leave your network and then you can search for it to see if anyone's stolen, stolen the information? That's one thing. With, what if you put an active beacon? So it's actually you know, signaling home from wherever it is so you can track it. Is, is that legal? Well, it starts to get more tricky. What about information that might leave your network and self-destruct or something like that? That gets really tricky. Um, and then there's all kinds of questions one can get into in terms of if someone is accessing your network and they're connected to your network, do you have any rights at all to uh, leverage that connection to gather intelligence that you might be able to use? Um, again, you know, it gets into really tricky legal questions. So um, 
there's, there's not a lot of clarity right now. And in fact, what's interesting is uh, there's a lot of debate on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act right now on the Hill because some people believe the act is uh, either too strong or being applied too strongly. So the Aaron Schwartz case is one example of that. But there's some others where people feel that the it's, it's a bit too strong and, and that the language is a bit too loose. And there's other people who feel that it actually needs to be strengthened uh, so that you can deter this activity more effectively. So there's debates there. Uh, Harvey Rishikoff is here, and he's leading a task force uh, at the American Bar Association that's looking at this issue. So there's a lot of interest in this, in this issue. And one of the things uh, that comes up is this question of, uh, first of all, roles and responsibilities. So what can the private sector do on its own? What can the government do? How can they work together? Um, and so there's a number of questions that come up there, and I hope this tees up uh, Jenny a little bit with things like uh, the ECS program that DHS has developed, where there is a partnership between the government and the private sector uh, to share information and provide some protections, and one could think about whether that act kind of activity should, should continue. There's also a question of should there be clear lines in the sand, in other words, should the laws be very clear about what companies can do to protect themselves, or is it better to have some legal ambiguity and let either case law sort of work itself out through the system or provide some ambiguity for the attackers so they're not exactly sure what the lines are and they're not sure what steps companies can take to protect themselves. So there's debate there. So uh, I'll just uh, stop right there and then uh, happy to discuss it further if there's any questions. Thanks, sir. And worked at the CERT for, for quite a while, but currently is the director of, as a long title, Stakeholder Engagement and Cyber Infrastructure Resilience uh, Leader, I guess is your, is your title. But as Herb said, uh, she's got the hard job of, uh, we talked a little bit about information sharing and collaboration, and Jenny has the job of, uh, of promoting that at, at DHS. So if we could, Jenny, could you give us some updates from your perspective? Sure, thanks, Bob. And um, is this catching my voice on the microphone? Yes? Yes? Okay, good. Um, so one of the, th the things the government can do, recognizing that there's a huge scale of critical infrastructure partners that we need to work with and a relatively limited size of government resources, um, one thing we can do is share information um, that we have. We do have some unique sources of information, whether it's from our partners in the intelligence community, whether it's what DHS sees from across the, the .gov, what it's our friends at DODC, protect it at DODC on their networks, law enforcement, et cetera. Um, so we have a broad set of information that we can share, and, and Sean Henry is right, right? That term does get over, overused a lot. It's a big blanket um, term. So when we work with critical infrastructure, sharing information, we need to recognize who we're sharing with what so that they can take action. Uh, sometimes that's actionable indicators. It's MD5 hash values. Sometimes it's sitting down with CEOs or CIOs, so we found to be a very productive group to work with, to make sure that they understand the threat, what really is the threat landscape, what are those most important things where they want to allocate their scarce resources, um, what decisions are they making in configuring their networks that may introduce significant risk, um, and what about some of the new technologies out there? You know, I've had a number of CIOs come to us and say, you know, should we be implementing application whitelisting? Is it worth the effort? Questions like that where there are a lot of vendors out there that are proposing different solutions and they are looking for kind of some objective lessons learned that they can find out from government. So how do we work with people that are making strategic investment decisions, CEOs, CIOs, et cetera? And then how do we work with folks within the critical infrastructure companies that are doing that real hands-on protection? Those are those actionable indicators. Um, and actually, right now, today, we're having a quarterly meeting of our Advanced Threat Technical Exchange, which is part of our, um, I mean, we have awful names for things. I think Secret Service always has great, really cool names for their programs, and we always have awful acronyms that don't even spell anything. Um, our Cybersecurity Information Sharing and Collaboration Program, um, I know it's awful, an awful acronym, I'll take suggestions. Um, but that's where we share uh, sensitive but unclassified information with critical infrastructure companies so that they can protect their own and their customers' networks. And they provide information back to us about what they're seeing on their networks. Uh, we do that through a legal agreement called a cooperative research and development agreement that really 
lays out how they can use our information and how we can use their information so that everybody is on the same page. And it's a program that grew out of lessons learned from the, the DIB CSIA program, um, a pilot that we did jointly with DOD in the financial services sector, and now is something where we've learned a lot of lessons and is available to all of the critical infrastructure sectors. So far we have 14 sectors, not in totality, um, but members of 14 different sectors that participate um, both through information sharing and analysis centers or individual companies where companies choose to do that or where there is no information sharing and analysis center. And so what we do through that program is we share those machine readable indicators um, and we are working toward increased machine readability. Um, you know, started at very basic CSV, but we're now working in, in a format uh, referred to as Sticks and Taxi, which some of our partners are actually piloting true machine-to-machine -machine communications with no human in the loop. What we're putting out in those formats is still pulled down off of a secure website. Um, but we share information with them. They share information with us on a regular basis. We've shared almost 20,000 indicators through the program. Uh, when we started about 18 months ago, about 80% of the indicators were coming from government and 20% were coming from the industry partners. Now it's 60-40, which I think it really shows that the industry partners are starting to see value and putting more in. And we're really seeing unique things about um, what our threat actors are doing in different sectors that we would not see in government. So there may be one threat actor that deals very differently when they're working against a you know, a, a manufacturing company than they would if they're trying to get into the Department of Defense. Um, so very different TTPs from those groups. Um, so we have the, the, the flow of the actionable indicators, we have mitigation strategies that go out, but then we've also found great value in these analyst to analyst exchanges like we're having today where people come in um, and talk to their peers and say, this is what happened to us and this is how I dealt with it, and then people can ask questions. And there have been many, many examples of where somebody has heard a company from another sector brief and they've been ready for what happens to them in the future, um, or they've been able to go back and immediately apply something that's already happening to them. Um, it's interesting because some people come into the room and will go and throw out their name, company, and sector, and then other people will just say, you know, my name is Bob, and that's all that they're willing to share. We do allow that anonymity for those who want it. Um, and we have government partners and industry partners that participate there, so I think that's an important part of the information exchanges. It's not just all about the ones and zeros going back and forth, but it's getting the smart people from industry and government having those technical discussions about what's working and what isn't with the actors. Um, so that's our CISPI program. Uh, as I mentioned, our Enhanced Cybersecurity Service is a new effort that DHS has launched. Um, it's something that started with the Defense Industrial Base DIB opt-in activity. Um, and back in the spring, DHS took over the relationship with the commercial service providers who provide those DIB opt-in services. Uh, now with the executive order that came out, DHS is able to work with those providers so that the services can be provided to all 16 critical infrastructure sectors. So for those of you who are not intimately familiar with what I mean when I say DIB opt-in or enhanced cybersecurity services, Basically, you know, we talk about terralining information, and what we share through CISPI is unclassified. We use a traffic light protocol that governs whether it's proprietary data or whether it's information that came from the government. Um, not everything can be terralined. So when we do enhanced cybersecurity services, this is where we provide those classified indicators up to the most sensitive levels of classification to um, information and communication technology providers so that they can protect their customers' networks if their customers choose to buy those services. Um, right now it is um, email filtering and DNS sync holding. Those are the two countermeasures that are available. Um, in addition to increasing the sectors who can buy the services, um, and the pilot that DOD did um, it was only ISPs participating. Um, we've expanded the kinds of um, ICT providers who can participate, managed security services providers, um, AV companies, companies like that have expressed an interest in coming in through the program. So it is very new in offering these services to other sectors. Um, there are Anytime you do something that's new and different, you don't realize all of the little details that you need to sort out until you do it. So how do you validate who can buy the services? Um, how do you figure out a process for adding new countermeasures? Uh, what are all those details that have to be sorted out? How do you get a memorandum of agreement signed and then get the systems accredited at the SCI level? Um, but this gives us an opportunity to take that information that can't be quickly um, tear line down to an unclassified level, get it to those ICT providers that a large percentage of our critical infrastructure community uses, and if those critical infrastructure companies are interested, allowing them to buy the services where they receive that protection with the classified information. 
So it's a very quick overview. Happy to answer more questions and go in different directions. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Good. Um, okay, so we've got uh, about 10 minutes uh, before we uh, have to move on to the, the next session. And uh, so what I'd like to do is, uh, is either open this up for some questions uh, from, the, from the group here since we have limited time. I've got one right here from this gentleman. Uh, yes, uh, Mike. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex Lawson. I'm from Inside U.S. China Trade. Um, Ms. Mena, uh, uh, Mr. Baker raised the specter of some different sort of enforcement uh, tactics that the government can take. He mentioned the visa issue. He hinted at some financial sanctions. Um, this kind of sen seems to center around business strategies pre for preventing uh, attacks, which is uh, valuable. But I was sort of uh, hoping to maybe get a, some information from you on tactics that the government thinks uh, are worthwhile for enforcement, the visa thing, the sanctions, or are there some other options uh, that the government can consider? There's been a lot of sort of public naming and shaming going on more. They were, met, you know, China was mentioned in the DOD report, but I don't know if there's anything with a little more teeth that the government can consider as a next step. I can only speak on behalf of DHS, and so DHS's role in cyber um, in our Office of Cybersecurity and Communications is very much focused on prevent, protect, building resilience, and then responding um, when there is an incident. So I can't speak on behalf of my interagency partners, um, but obviously this is an issue that is discussed as a whole of government discussion, um, each with our respective roles. I think I only understand. Another question from the uh, from the group? Yes, sir. Stand up and yeah. give us your name, please. My name is Alexander Foley. I'm a oh, here's your mic here, just so we can hear. Thank you. My name is Alexander Soli. I'm a Delta Risk, and I was considering the idea something out that David DeWatt mentioned earlier about how most of our cybersecurity is based off of sorry, most of the antivirus is based off of blacklisting and such. And I was wondering if anyone has been considering more sort of alternative to that or any sort of legality issues involved with creating some sort of autonomous way of finding si critical uh, vulnerabilities and such. That was what maybe Irving could... You wanna uh, Anybody want to try that, or I, I can, I, you know, I give you a lawyer's view of uh, cybersecurity, which is not necessarily something you should take to the bank, or at least I wouldn't code it directly. But uh, uh, yeah, I think the, one of our biggest strategic problems. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story from the border. Uh, when I went down to the border, when I just started at DHS and I was dealing with the Border Patrol, uh, routinely they'd say, well, we sent out two border agents and they brought back 30 people who were trying to cross the border. And I finally said, how do, you, how do two agents bring back 30 people? And he said, oh, well, we surround them. I, I, <laughs> but the real answer was, they surrendered because the worst thing that would happen is they would be taken back across the border and let go to try again. Um, this is where we are with keeping people out of our networks. I, we, after we've spent a boatload of money uh, uh, stopping up all the rat holes, they spearfish us again and 90% of the time somebody's going to open uh, the, uh, uh, the email. And the reason is it's getting past all of our signature-based solutions, and we do need automated mechanisms for dealing with that. It, it seems, you know, uh, FireEye, I know, has sponsored this, but the fact is they've got an interesting approach to this, which is to say, let's put this in a virtual machine and just watch what it does. And if it doesn't do what PDFs usually do, then we're not delivering it. Uh, I, and you don't actually have to know in advance that this is bad. You don't even have to know what bad things it's trying to do. If it's doing something that Adobe didn't tell you it was supposed to do, you just don't deliver it. It seems to me that that has some real potential to make it much harder for people to get back in. Um, and to go back to the border, you know, now when they stop people crossing the border, there's a distinct chance that there will be a struggle, uh, even gunplay. Uh, and that is a reflection, oddly, of how much better border security is, because they don't expect to be able to get in if they can't, you know, break 
past this. If they're coming from Latin America, they're going to have a long flight. They're not just going to be let, let go across the border. Uh, and I think we will know we're doing a better job when it is harder to get people out of the network than it is today. Thanks, Joe. Uh, any other uh, questions? From we got a little bit more time. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, DJ Balo from Robert Morris University. Talk a little bit louder, please. Or get closer to the mic. Right, hi, I'm uh, DJ Balo, and I'm from Robert Morris University. I know uh, hacking back is a big gray area, but how do, how is that area, how is the U.S. area and viewpoint on that like compared to other countries, and how does that affect our defense modeling? Well, let me let me take a quick, quick shot at that. That's a, that's an interesting and complex question. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, I, I like to say, you know, for every cyber warrior, there's a cyber lawyer looking over their shoulder, and AT and T is is no different than that. Uh, and the government, you know, my government experience was the same way. Uh, the the uh, problem today is, for example, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act basically says what you cannot do in in cyber security in, in a you know, in attacking somebody else's system. It says if you do this, it's illegal, you can get arrested for doing that. It doesn't define what you can do going back in the other direction. It doesn't define any particular uh, framework for what you can do in response to a penetration. So there's a lot of discussion going on right now, including on the Hill, as we're looking at the cyber legislation, uh, the CISPA Act, uh, of course, has been passed by the House. It's going to, you know, that's the same topic is being taken up in the Senate. And one of the discussions that's taking place is what countermeasures are, or defensive measures, or active defense measures, or whatever you want to call it, are allowable under the law. I think Irv might have mentioned this that, okay, if I set up a honeypot and I put dummy data in there, that's relatively, you know, accepted today from a legal perspective. There are some liability issues, okay, but it's relatively benign, okay? Suppose I set up a honeypot and in that, in that dummy file I place malware that's going to destroy the file structure of the machine that it gets downloaded to, okay? That's probably not legal <laughs> under today's uh, laws. And, and probably never should be. Uh, and one of the biggest issues there, which we wrestle with every day, and it's you know, part of this whitelist, blacklist question, is uh, most of the hosts that are compromised, and these are websites and hosting, cloud hosting services that are compromised, are compromised not by the owners of the site, but by somebody who's a bot master going, or controller or coder, whatever you want to call it, going around looking for machines to compromise that I can then use to distribute malware. So they may be innocent, but typically the, the first thing you see where you think this attack is coming from is an innocent bystander. So from a legal perspective, what do you want to do to an innocent bystander? We're having discussions right now with DHS and with FBI about, okay, we, we see these sites, we see a bad site, we can tell right away it's, it's downloading malware to our customers. And number one, can I share that legally with you um, you know, the identifier information, which is typically IP addresses and URLs and, and Macs and things like that that we can see out of the network traffic. But then what can you do with that? Can you go in and knock on the door and of, the, of the hosting service and say, hey, guys, you got a problem, and let's work together to get that fixed? That's still a very gray area in, in the law right now, and people, of course, and with, particularly with CISPA, as soon as the uh, idea of sharing and liability coming along with that uh, gets the privacy people very upset because their interpretation of the of CISPA is you can break the law and get away with it because you get immunity in the process. You can do anything you want, whatever whatever you violate anybody's privacy, and you've been immu immunized by this legislation. You can get what you get out of jail free. So that's kind of where we are in wrestling with that whole topic is, and we're hoping that out of this Senate and House legislative process. We're going to get some clearer guidance from a legal perspective about what can be shared, what purposes for which that can be shared, and then, you know, uh, how do you protect privacy in, in, within that context? Is sharing an IP address a violation of somebody's privacy? Uh, not clear uh, today what, if, if that is or not. 
So, so I, I, I've blogged about this, and uh, one of the things that uh, I pointed out in a recent blog post is that uh, uh, Luxembourg has turned out to have more cojones than the entire United States cybersecurity establishment. Uh, they got a guy there who just said, uh, he read the mandate report, he said, well, why do you kind of go from the command and control server back to the unit? Why don't I just go looking for all the poison ivy, all the guys running poison ivy, and break into their network. And he did that, uh, found all kinds of, of interesting stuff. Uh, the response from the U.S. government has been to say, well, you know, oh, that could be, could be illegal. Uh, you know, that's a bad idea. Uh, but what they're really saying is, we don't know how to protect you, but we do know how to prevent you from protecting yourself. Uh, it's absolutely nuts. This is an old... Uh, computer crime section view of the world, kind of leave it to the professionals. You know, when you say leave it to the professionals when you're dealing with crime, you got to actually be able to do something if you're a professional. Our professionals are completely unable to protect us. In the end, people will find ways to protect themselves. Uh, uh, currently, the, the law is written so vaguely that almost everything is illegal. Many things that we do today as a matter of routine are arguably illegal under the Computer Crime uh, uh, and Abuse Act. Uh, uh, and um, until we find a way to embarrass the Justice Department into starting to say, yeah, we didn't mean to, you couldn't pr protect yourself in some way, uh, we are going to have a uniquely disabled cybersecurity infrastructure in this country. Oh, so just one minute uh, on this. So, so there's a really, really interesting legal uh, issue which, which has been discussed here, which is absolutely fascinating. There's also a policy question. So, uh, you know, let's assume the law gets clarified and there's clarity on what companies can do and, and uh, not do. But then there's, there's going to be an equities uh, discussion here. So, for example, let's say that, that companies are given more leeway to take certain action. That might undermine uh, U.S. diplomatic efforts to establish certain norms in cyberspace. Um, or it might not, but or it might be worth having that, or it might not. So, so there's there's going to be a really interesting policy discussion in terms of what the U.S. is trying to accomplish internationally, in terms of norms of behavior, even discussions uh, on the in internet governance fora, uh, which you know Jim can tell you all about or what's going on there. But it might have an impact on that as well. So uh, it, it's a very interesting issue from a policy perspective as well as a legal one. So we're out of time. Um I get the hook from Jim back here, but I would like to, I would like to uh, summarize, you know, one thing from my perspective, having been in this business a long time, which is that um, we've heard some great discussion today, some very difficult legal issues and policy issues that we have to, to address. But from the standpoint of where we are today versus where we were just looking back five to ten years ago, um, I, I think we've accomplished a lot of things. Now, have we accomplished it at the pace we should? Absolutely not. Is the threat having, you know, a field day? Absolutely. Uh, but I can remember in, in, uh, back having to go to the Hill uh, with Sean and a lot of the other uh, folks that were part of the cyber group. The Hill didn't even understand any of this stuff five to ten years ago. All this discussion we're having right now, they didn't have the foggiest notion about this topic. And we'd have to bring props into the Hill to get them to understand just the basics of what this topic of cybersecurity was all about. At the same time, 10 years ago, NSA thought they could build pretty much anything that was needed in the most critical areas uh, in this space. It was all about you know, government built or government enhanced solutions. NSA doesn't believe that anymore. They realize the private sector, in large measure, has the capability to build the right solutions in this space. Uh, you look at what Ashar was talking about earlier with FireEye. FireEye was built by an idea that was germinated uh, by DARPA. We need a problem solved in zero days. FireEye was born. Uh, InQtel invested in it, the CIA's uh, um, you know, arm for investment and innovation, and it was born. And that's happening all over the place with Silicon Valley and things like that. So the good news is you know, we have lots of solutions coming into play. Lots of solutions even in the active defense area. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of room for optimism, but there's no doubt that I think we've heard, you know, today that there's a tremendous amount of frustration. 
we've got to speed up, get the, get the car shifted from first gear, and get it shifted up to third or fourth gear, and what's the best way to go about doing that? We did not get into the issue of you know, how much regulation, how much uh, uh, strong uh, policies that we have to put in place to deal with this, but the reality is I think every one of us should be a little bit more optimistic, but clearly we still have a long way to go in this space. So hopefully uh, the, the discussions uh, this morning have been enlightening. It brought up some interesting issues I know uh, today. Um, and I know some of us are going to be around uh, uh, for the next session for further uh, dialogue with each one of you. Jim, did you have some closing comments? Okay, and thank you, CSIS, for helping to host this.